In the 2010 remake of the movie Karate Kid, Jackie Chan plays the wise and old Mr. Han, a kung fu master challenged with teaching a young and inexperienced student. With notable differences, Han's training and advice is very much like that of Mr. Miyagi in the original Karate Kid, which is streaming on Netflix now if you want to go check that out after this sermon. But anyway, Han's training is, uh, is interesting because he asks his pupil to take off his jacket, hang it back up on the hook, take it off the hook, put his jacket back on, take his jacket back off, and hang it back up on the hook over and over again. And this is very intentionally reminiscent of young Daniel waxing Mr. Miyagi's car in the original movie. In each movie, the master gives this veiled teaching, the reason for which isn't really discernible until it's practiced over and over again. Only then does the reason for hanging up of the jacket and the waxing on and off become apparent. Much like a Zen cone or these martial arts masters, Jesus' parable for us today isn't that easy to grasp at first glance. It requires sitting with the text, letting it marinate a little bit. One of the most common ways to read this text is as a kind of spiritualized, allegorical, end-time prophecy. Seen that way, there are the foolish and the wise. And if you're wise, you get to go to the banquet, which is usually interpreted as heaven. And if you're unwise, Jesus, the bridegroom, has some pretty uncharacteristically harsh words to say to you. But many scholars and theologians would push back on that reading. Admittedly, to our ears, this kind of sounds apocalyptic, and it fits between several other apocalyptic uh, stories. But in Jesus' time, these end-time narratives didn't always carry the weight of the literal end of the world. In fact, it was a common way of speaking about the current social reality. It's a way of projecting the present circumstances into the future and extrapolating the consequences. We see this in Daniel, Ezekiel, Micah, Revelation, uh, and other places throughout Scripture. The apparent apocalyptic judgment isn't between the wise and the foolish at the end of time, but it's about the wise and the foolish in this time, right now, wherever the story is heard. Theologian Rosemary Radford Ruther talks about this apocalypticism as a kind of countercultural critique of the dominant system. The writer of Matthew is using this apocalyptic section in chapters 24 and 25 not as a description of final judgment, but as a judgment on first century attitudes, ideas, and happenings. So for us, 2,000 years later, historically, culturally, and geographically removed from the customs and practices of the day, this text is speaking to our current reality, our current social relationships, our work situations, our current approaches to life and finances and love and happiness. And if we are courageous enough to go there with the text, if courageous enough to look ourselves in the mirror, this text might offer a new reality, a new way of being in the world, potentially a wise life. One of the temptations, though, when faced with a passage as polarized as this one, is to too quickly identify with the wise or the righteous in the story. Most of us tend to think we're on the good team. And there's actually kind of a term for this, and you might be familiar with it. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, different studies give different percentages, but researchers and psychologists agree. We tend to overestimate our competence on average. We like to identify with the protagonists in the movies. We see ourselves as good people, and we identify with the righteous or the wise in these kinds of parables. But hypothetically, what if? What if we're not quite as competent or as wise or as righteous as we'd like to think we are? What if we're not, as the self-proclaimed wise people, supposed to go and preach this text to those worldly unwise? If we're supposed to get the most out of this passage, I think it might be best to suspend our judgment and have the courage to open ourselves up to the warnings, the critiques, and the invitations that this text has to offer. So what are those warnings and invitations? The obvious place to start would be the differences between the wise and the unwise. Because both sets of bridesmaids had lamps, they both waited for the bridegroom, they both even fell asleep on the job. The only thing that the bridesmaids who, that the unwise bridesmaids didn't have was oil. And I'm not an expert on first century lamps, but that seems like a pretty important piece of the equation. When I was in seventh grade, the basketball team was school sponsored for the first time. And this meant that there were going to be tryouts, because up until that point, everyone had kind of played in the same local rec league. And I was nervous about these tryouts. So in the week leading up to them, I was in the driveway every night, practicing dribbling with both hands, sliding my feet on defense, uh, hustling, getting in shape, all of these kinds of things. And tryouts came and went, and I didn't think that I was gonna be a star, but I, I really wanted to make the team, and I did, and I was thrilled. That meant I got to go to live practices and the school basketball games, 
And so we were preparing, and there were a couple away games before our first home game. And I remember that feeling of the first home game. I was nervous, because I knew that my friends, my parents, my grandparents were going to be in the crowd. And whew, that's a lot of pressure. So I didn't start, and I rode the bench most of the game, but just before halftime, I got my chance. The coach put me in, and I was ready. I was hustling, I was playing defense, I was trying to dribble with both hands, and then the moment of truth finally came. I was on a fast break, and I beat everyone down the floor, and I stood in the right-hand corner of the court, just outside the three-point line, and my friend passed me the ball. And all of a sudden, I was wide open with the ball in my hands, keenly aware of how awesome I was about to look. So I squat down, I raise the ball up to my shoulder, and I let it go, and I severely overestimated the amount of force it takes to get a ball to the basket. The ball ended up sailing feet over the hoop and into the hands of the other team. I was embarrassed, ashamed, mortified, and I'm pretty sure I didn't shoot another shot the entire rest of the game. Uh, needless to say, I also didn't earn myself much more playing time with that performance. Much like the unways, unwise bridesmaids in the story had their lamps but hadn't accounted for oil, I had accounted for all kinds of stuff, sliding my feet, hustle, desire, defense, dribbling, but I hadn't accounted for some very important aspects of being a good basketball player, namely the ability to shoot and to do so when my adrenaline was pumping. Now without oil, the bridesmaids were carrying around these empty lamps, kind of useless, burdensome, extra baggage that didn't really help them with what they were ultimately trying to accomplish. They were supposed to wait for the bridegroom and then lead a processional into the banquet. But when they realized they had no oil and they left to go find more, it was too late. They were left outside. They were in the dark with no way to illuminate. And they were left outside the banquet. One of these parables, or one of the ways that these parables can be read, this parable specifically, is as a way of kind of thinking about our religious beliefs and practices. If religion is the term that we give to all of the ways that we relate to God, it's kind of our outer carrying container. It's our lamp, if you will. And that means there has to be oil. So what would one ingredient be that, if not in the equation, would run a, kind of render the uh, project useless? If we look further in Matthew 25, we get some context clues and we come to the passage, it's more famous and more well-known, where Jesus is talking about feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, and caring for the sick. And in that passage, it appears that those aren't just add-ons to the life of faith. Matthew seems to describe them as the very ways that we see and we know God, as the way we come face-to-face -face with Christ. And going back to the scripture we read earlier this morning, Amos 5 is a tough, brutal text. God says this, I hate, I despise your festivals. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I'm not even listening. And this passage has troubled worship leaders, musicians, and pastors for decades and centuries. Rightly so. If God doesn't want our worship, what is it that God wants? In the critique, or right after the critique of the Israelites' festivals and religious practices in Amos 5, verse 24 says this, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God appears to be less interested in our pious devotion and more interested in who we take care of, who we look out for, and how we treat our neighbor. When I was a teenager, I was fortunate enough to have an incredible youth pastor. His name was Scott Pugh, and he was one of those people whose faith moved him into action. He was a charismatic guy and made everyone around him feel like a million bucks. And even more, he was consistently showing up for the kids on the margins, the kids with broken families and kids struggling with drugs or drinking. And one of the things that bothered me as a teenager was that I thought he spent a little too much time with those kids and not with me who had some talent and had commitment and led worship and led small groups and even taught a, a, a Sunday school. And I was a little jealous when I found out that he took two kids to a rock concert. I did all of those things and I never got that invite. And looking back, that may have been the most important lesson that Scott ever taught me. See, he cared about all of us, and he cared about me, but he was radically committed to those who were left out and to those to whom life had dealt more sick, difficult circumstances. One of the names for this empty religion is what sociologists call moralistic therapeutic deism. And moralistic therapeutic deism is a way of thinking about religion that kind of imagines God to be this distant creator who kind of wound everything up and let it go and the laws of physics kind of take care of the day. And this God is moralistic and wants people to be nice and fair and to do good things. And this God also is therapeutic and wants you to be happy and to feel good about yourself. And none of those things are completely horrible. 
But one of the problems with moralistic therapeutic deism is that it can turn a person's religious life into a private affair concerning one's own personal actions and well-being. Meanwhile, God gets distracted or dis abstracted, not distracted. God gets abstracted to being this distant cosmological watchmaker, this sort of disinterested ancillary being in the sky until we have a breakup, we have a need, we get sick or face some kind of a crisis. And this is not the picture of God that we get in Matthew 25, in Amos 5, or throughout the witness of Scripture. In fact, we see a God radically concerned and involved with the fate of the world. We see an incarnational God who is showing up in the midst of our brokenness. The first time we get to know the name of God is in the context of the liberation of the Hebrew slaves from the hands of the Egyptians. And as Christians, we claim to know God most fully in Christ, a first century rabbi in Roman-occupied Jerusalem who spent much of his time and attention with the sick, the broken, the poor, and the hurting. John the Baptist once asked Jesus, he sent a messenger and said, are you the Messiah? Or should we be waiting for someone else? And Jesus replied, go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. This is how Jesus identified himself. He identified himself with the plight of those on the underside of history. Theologian Dorothy Soul shows us how this empty religion can function. She asks us to imagine proclaiming the words, God loves you, to a man who's been on the streets, without a home, and without a job for the last 15 years. This man has learned the hard way that this world is not a place of goodness, truth, beauty, and hope. But this world is a hard place where everybody's looking out for themselves, everyone's looking out for number one. How does that man make sense of this phrase, God loves you? What kind of God would create a world where he's in the situation that he's in? Soul says that those three words, God loves you, can only have a meaning when they intend the transformation of that man's status quo. When we get involved, when we have something to do, when we, we desire to change that man's circumstances, we don't just say and announce the love of God, but we bring it into existence, into human form, the word made flesh. There's a type of therapy that uh, counselors use. It's called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And the goal of this therapy is simple. You accept what is and you work with what you've got. You might want to change the circumstances of your life, but if you wait for that to happen to you, you might never get anywhere. So you work with the people in the situations that we have right now. And therapists who work in this way talk about something they call defusion. And it's not diffusion like the spreading out or the thinning, but defusion, like defusing all of the little things that make up one big whole. For instance, lemonade. Lemonade is a sim simple substance made of three ingredients, lemon juice, water, and sugar. And it takes all three of those parts to make lemonade. If you remove or defuse the water from the equation, you're left with lemon juice and sugar. Not at all a delicious and refreshing summer drink. And our faith is like that. Yes, we need worship. And yes, we need hope. And yes, we need metaphysical beliefs. But when our ideas and our practices around God, faith, and religion become separated or defused from our concern for justice and righteousness, we are left with lemon juice and sugar. We're left carrying lamps without oil. And our religion is empty. In this passage, God is not trying to scare us into submission. But the parable does alert us to some very real consequences of not pursuing a more just, uh, a more beautiful world. It's 2020, and I don't need to remind you of all of the grief that this year has brought many of us. I don't need to rehash everything that's gone on uh, or replay it. But in the face of 2020, in the face of these circumstances, in the face of the weight of those consequences, God is holding out an invitation to the eternal kind of life, life to the full. The warning about empty religion and lamps without oil isn't a threat, and it's not meant to paralyze or to shame, but it's to show us the way to the banquet. Real, full, rich, wonderful life is found when every member of society and every creature is cared for, loved, and set free to be who God created them to be. Moralistic therapeutic deism and empty religion ask us to fall in line to obey in order to feel good, to be a good person, and to get on with life. And God becomes this kind of all-important, self-absorbed bridegroom denying us entrance uh, and happiness unless we know the right things, can say the right things. We show up to church on Sunday and we smile at our neighbors. But that is not the God that Jesus is bringing out. And that is not the God of the, of the gospel. 
The God of Jesus we call father, mother, brother, sister, and friend. The good news is that Jesus came to save, to liberate, to emancipate, to loose our chains, to undo the ties that bind, to invite us into a shared life together that works for all creation. God is what is calling us on. God is the invitational, the alluring, the drawing forward into a deeper love with our planet and every brother and sister of background, ability, gender, race, and class. When Jesus is showing us the way to eternal life, he's standing in the line of Hebrew prophets like Amos that are calling for an upending of the social hierarchy and a new way of relating to one another. And this parable closes with one final admonition. It says, keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And many Christians and commentators would read into this that Jesus is talking about some kind of second coming when Jesus comes again in all of his glory. But again, I would side with those who would push back against those kind of once and for all end time overtones. And I would look to the context. Jesus is just about to say a few verses later, what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So keep watch, keep your eyes open, be on the lookout. Today, Jesus is telling us, keep watch for the people who don't look like you and might have a harder time navigate, navigating this world. Keep watch for the people who don't fit into categories and boxes that this world loves to reward. Keep watch for those struggling with too much on their plates. Keep watch for those battling the hidden enemies, trying to destroy their mental health and their relationships. Keep watch for the isolated and the lonely. Keep watch for the poor and the economically unstable. Keep watch for those who don't have a roof, a roof over their heads. Keep watch for our planet because it is groaning under the weight that we are asking it to bear. Keep watch because in the face of the other, we glimpse the divine. And in this way, Jesus is always coming again. But if we get wrapped up in empty religion and worship as kind of a side dish to the rest of our lives, we will miss out. Religion is not sort of a decorative lamp to be carried around, but it is a fire burning in the night, making the invisible visible, and consuming the lies that tell us that people deserve less because of the color of their skin, their cognitive ability, their ancestors' access to jobs and wealth, or any fact that is not based on their inherent worth as a child of God. One of the questions that haunts humanity is something like, what is the meaning of life? How do I find purpose? What does a good life look like? And this parable is both an invitation to that meaning and purpose and a warning that, yes, you can numb your way through life. You can distract and entertain and radically miss the point and miss the opportunity to dwell in the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. Theologian Stanley Hauerwas says, in a world where people are dying of boredom, Christianity gives us something to do. And in this world, Jesus is giving us something to do. Jesus is calling to us in the face of the oppressed, in the voices calling out for justice, and in the lives of the marginalized. Keep watch, friends, because Jesus is always coming again. The moral imperative for justice cannot be defused from our worship and our piety. Without justice, we are carrying empty lamps. Without justice, our worship quickly becomes empty religion. But the table is set and the food is prepared and you are invited. God's banquet is for one and all if we seek a more just, a more whole, and a more beautiful world. Thanks be to God. Amen.